Good afternoon. And welcome to the uh, second half of the session. <clears throat> Both this morning's opening remarks um, and this afternoon's uh, address, I think, brilliantly set the stage for what it is about this panel, you know, we'll discuss. This is not the first time, as Tim Wu said, um, that the issue of bigness has come about, nor the attention focused on antitrust <coughs> on a more national level. There was one time, at least during my age, where it was said that <clears throat> what's good for General Motors is good for the country. <laughs> the question really is, as um, Paul Romer said this morning, is bigness bad? We don't tend to answer that in this panel. What we tend to want to do is explore it and explore it because in the sage words of one particular Supreme Court decision, just as the common law adapts to modern understanding of greater experience, so does to the Sherman Act's prohibition of restraints of trade, evolve to meet the dynamics of present economic conditions. In the old days, it was big oil and big railroads. Today, it's big tech. Do, do the current laws that we have really respond adequately to the challenges posed by the dynamics of a new economy, big technology. For example, you know, is it necessary for an analytical antitrust framework to focus as a touchstone of antitrust policy the concept of consumer welfare? What is consumer welfare? Usually, what courts look to is a metric. But as Paul Romer said today, can you really utilize consumer welfare by referencing a metric of intangible? The intangible being what is good and or what is bad. How do <clears throat> courts deal with that? How does the law deal with that? How do we go beyond just pricing and output? Judge Walker this morning talked about technologically <laughs> dynamic markets. It's an economic principle, and, and it was recognized by the judiciary, at least in the Microsoft case, that in such dynamic markets, entrenchment may be temporary because innovation may alter the, fi alter the field, which leads the markets in which firms compete through the, competing through that innovation only acquire temporary market dominance from which they may be displaced by the next wave of product advancement. How does this type of market dynamism require, if at all, adjustments to competition enforcement and judicial accountability? Tim Wu just mentioned unreasonable restraints of trade, putting aside per se <coughs> violations. Within the context of unreasonable restraints of trade are a litany of factors that have to be considered by the courts. But we tend to forget that at least in this country, when we talk about consideration in judicial opinion, uh, decisions or in judgments, it is not the judge that may make that decision. It is a jury. And how practical is it for a jury to take those considerations across a variety of elements into adjudicating whether or not within the intangible of something that is reasonable or unreasonable in terms of a restraint of trade, particularly in this new economy. What we're looking for, as one of the questioners said, is not necessarily action, it's thought. What problems or abuses may be engendered by the growth or acquisition of market power? And what, if anything, should be done or can be done under existing law, either by, exist by statute or by decision? <clears throat> that gives us a good segue into the panel, which is made up of enforcers, practitioners, as well as you know, um, eminent academics. <clears throat> 
And for those who know me, one of the first things that I do is I like to question everything by at least defining what is the scope that we're going to be you know, um, looking at and analyzing. Well, the first part of that is what is consumer welfare? What do we mean by that as the touchstone of antitrust policy? I'd like to start by asking um, Ted. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let me just uh, start by saying I'm extremely honored to be on one of these uh, tremendous programs that Eleanor and Harry and uh, Herb Scherr have put together. Uh, I've participated in a few over the years, and it just this place is really a beacon of antitrust learning because of their efforts, so uh, very grateful to them. I think we all should be. Uh, having said that, I'm disappointed that there are only two Nobel Prize winners on this program. <laughs> I, I guess Mike Spence maybe is spending the winter in Hawaii, but, but in any event, I'll, I'll try to look beyond that. Uh, I also have to give credit to myself that, um, you know, with the, the coronavirus and uh, the supermassive black hole a couple blocks down on Wall Street devouring everything and criminals running in the street because of the new New York bail law, I, by coming in this combination of, uh, of progressive uh, and, uh, and uh, hipster antitrust advocates, I've found the most dangerous place in the most dangerous city in the world. <laughs> uh, having said that, and, and having felt that that was reinforced both by uh, Paul Romer's uh, remarks and, and also by Tim Wu, uh, and to get specifically to the question that Michael asked me, uh, the, I have to say that the focus on consumer welfare and the so-called consumer welfare standard, uh, the concern is, is almost completely misplaced, I think. It's based on mischaracterizations, misunderstandings, and I think the, the easiest way to appreciate that is uh, I heard Tim say that he is more in favor of a, of a competitive process standard than a consumer welfare standard, but, but the fact is, fortunately, uh, we don't need to deal with nebulous questions about what the uh, original legislative intent of the Sherman and Clayton Acts uh, were. Uh, we have statutes that actually speak in terms of competition. Competition is the, uh, uh, what, what an economist would call the instrumental variable of the antitrust agencies. It is that which antitrust law is intended to affect directly. Uh, section 1 says no restraint of trade. Section 2 says no monopolizing any part of trade or commerce. And Clayton Act Section 7 says no merging if there's a uh, tendency to lessen competition substantially or to create a monopoly. That is kind of the fixed part of antitrust law. So why, why are we talking about the objectives and why are we talking about consumer welfare? I think that it's the, it is a statement of a broader understanding of how you decide whether a particular practice that affects competition actually helps or hurts the basic antitrust objective. Is it making the economy, is it making the productivity of our economy greater or less? And by, by focusing on that in the hard cases, that's the way that you make sure that antitrust enforcement doesn't go off the rails. You know, uh, back in the, there was a reference to the uh, era in antitrust enforcement when it was really easy for a plaintiff or the government to win a case. That's because everything was per se illegal uh, starting about the 1960s and really culminating uh, in 1972 at the Topco decision. Uh, under Schwinn, all vertical restraints were per se illegal. Uh, under Vons Grocery all, and, and, and Brown Shoe, all mergers were essentially per se illegal. Under Alcoa and United Shoe Machinery, all acts by a monopolist were essentially illegal unless the monopolist uh, carried the burden of showing that its success was unavoidable, even though its practices had been perfectly in accord with normal uh, uh, you know, efficiency enhancing uh, uh, conduct. Uh, for example, Alcoa uh, went so far as to say there was a violation of Section 2 because a big aluminum producer had, had added capacity to meet demand. Uh, I submit to you, I don't think any court, uh, certainly not our Supreme Court nowadays, uh, 
uh, would say that's a, a violation of Section 2, at, and, um, and rightfully so. So what, once you reorient yourself uh, in that sense and, and focus on the fact that the statute requires the preservation of competition, and you think of the maximizing the value, the wealth producible from our scarce resources as the, the thing you focus on when you find a hard question. You know, they're easy questions. Uh, uh, cartels, that's an easy question. Uh, Post-sale restraints in a transfer of a business, that's an easy question. But all these questions that we've been focusing on, uh, how you assess uh, t you know, uh, uh, two-sided markets and, and the conduct of digital platforms and, and, and other you know, price squeezes and other tricky stuff, those are very tricky questions and the only way you can, you can assure yourself that you're not contradicting the fundamental uh, purpose of using the antitrust laws to make wealth grow in our society. You have to check. The way you check is by conducting economics. Now, I agree with some of the statements that some of the economics gets a little abstruse and maybe there is a little bit of excess uh, uh, quantitative focus. But it, unless you ask that question in the difficult case, you'll never get to an answer that makes any sense in terms of fundamental antitrust purposes. When I listen to what you're saying, uh, fundamental antitrust purposes um, has to include more than just one metric. Am I correct? Um, if, no. <laughs> OK. The, uh, I, I, you have to ask yourself the question in, 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 in discussing this. You have to ask yourself the question, do you believe in welfare economics? If you think there is such a thing as uh, the society's economic wealth, then the, the, the question you're trying to ask whenever you, an, when you analyze the objective is, is this, in, is this increasing wealth or is this damaging wealth? And that's why the per se era uh, was so readily rejected when the ideas of Harold Demsetz and Bob Bork uh, came to light in the mid-1970s because it was demonstrable that if you had such a narrow and formalistic definition of restraint of competition that you were condemning vertical territorial restraints and patent licensing restrictions per se, you, you were damaging the, uh, the ability of the antitrust laws to serve uh, the economy by per, creating more wealth. Per se is clearly like the dinosaur going the way you know, of extinction. So Steve, if you had to advise a court, what instruction would it give to a jury in terms of um, them evaluating improving economic wealth? Let, let, let me first respond to Ted. Uh, as you I, can tell, this has not been rehearsed either. I find as a matter of moral discipline that I should agree with Tad at least once a year about one thing. <laughs> and I agree, I'm also honored to be on the panel. <laughs> when Tad started, I thought I was going to agree about uh, the consumer welfare standard. I mean, because I also think that economics should have a role in antitrust, and I think the consumer welfare standard is pretty good. But listening to Tad, he didn't define the consumer welfare standard. Uh, he talked about wealth maximization. And that's not the consumer welfare standard. That's Bork's uh, confusing definition or manipulative definition of consumer welfare. What Tad was talking about was aggregate welfare that counts the welfare of stockholders, that, if you will, treats stockholders as honorary consumers. What the consumer welfare standard is about, uh, based on welfare economics, it's about price and quantity. And so if price goes up and quantity goes down, total welfare may not fall. Total welfare may rise because the stockholders made a lot more money, even though consumers were hurt. And that's not what the courts look at and that's not consumer welfare. Consumer welfare is about purchasers. And as Tim said at lunch, you can expand that idea to be the idea of trading partner welfare to, to include the, to bring in monopsony, monopsony power. But it's still based on, I think what, 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 what Tad may have meant is it's based on price and quantity, that level of welfare. It's not based on eliminating economic inequality. Antitrust has nothing to say about, or not within the standard about improving economic e equality. The consumer welfare standard can handle innovation, it can handle potential entry, but it cannot handle uh, the distribution of income. 
So what would I tell a court? I tell a court focus on price and quantity, and when I say price and quantity, I also mean non-price factors like quality. I also mean dynamic. I mean quantity in the long run, which includes innovation. Now, I would not make the same mistake that Justice Thomas made by saying an improvement in quantity is good even if quantity exceeds the competitive level, uh, which was one of the mistakes in, in Amex, but in general, we, we care about those economic parameters. Yeah, I know from a regulatory point of view, um, what statute or, or um, guidance would you give to business, you know, um, a, as well as the courts with regard to what standard of welfare um, that antitrust policy should be aimed at achieving? The, the welfare of purchasers would be this would be the initial paradigm. And would that include, um, as Paul suggested this morning, a determination of what's bad? Bad? Bad. On, wh on what grounds? Um, that's what we're trying to seek. This morning, we started off with big is bad. At least big or big tech is bad. How do you measure bad in a, in a competitive <coughs> sense or a welfare sense? Do they restrict innovation? Do they deter entry that would lead to more competition and price quality and innovation? Daniel, from a regulatory perspective, how would, what guidance would you provide? So I'd follow up on something Steve said, and let me start and keep myself out of FTC jail by saying that everything that I say today is my own view, not the FTC's view or any other commissioner. We have a whole dungeon under the FTC for people who forget to say that. <laughs> um, so let me follow behind Steve uh, by contrasting wealth and welfare, because they're very different. Uh, wealth is about money, and the kind of wealth maximization standard that we might associate with some of the academic work of Judge Posner um, is really coming from a very different place from welfare, either the total welfare standard that Bork meant when he used the term consumer welfare, or the truly consumer-focused consumer welfare standard that I take Steve to be underlining, and that we use at the FTC and that most courts use to orient, uh, to, to follow behind Michael's question, to, to tell the difference between good and bad. We ask ultimately, you know, using as our measure of good and bad only demand that exists in the market without making value judgments about whether the things for which there are demand are good things or bad things, whether a consequence of challenged conduct or a challenged transaction would be more satisfaction of that demand or less satisfaction, more aggregate welfare for consumers or less. And I want to say just a couple of things about the consumer welfare standard because sometimes it gets caricatured in a way that I really think doesn't help the discussion. And at points in Tim Wu's talk, I couldn't quite tell whether he was really taking issue with a, a sort of comprehensive thoughtful, inclusive version of the consumer welfare standard or with the caricature that we sometimes get. So there is a view that I hear often that being concerned with consumer welfare means you are concerned only with dollars in pockets, that you're concerned only with effects on nominal price. That is not true. That has never been true. So it's true, of course, that nominal price is something that it's easy for us to spot and measure and identify. So when we have some conduct, you know, and we can look back and see, gosh, you know, what things can we see that it changed? One of the easiest things to look at is nominal price. But we look at things other than price all the time. And even price alone is meaningless unless we're talking about it in the context of quality as well. So, to pick an example that is much less glamorous than some of the sort of big tech conversations that we have at the minute, hospital mergers. In hospital mergers, we look at quality effects all the time. Sometimes they make all the difference for a variety of reasons, some regulatory, some commercial, between clearing a merger and blocking it. So the notion that the consumer welfare standard means counting dollars in pockets is just mistaken. Can the consumer welfare standard, I've heard today, can it handle sort of very concentrated markets? Can it handle complex schemes or complex uh, patterns of behavior in tech markets where there's a dominant player? And I would say yes. Look at our Qualcomm litigation where a, a baseband uh, cellular chip monopolist uh, engaged in a variety of different practices to protect its monopoly. Look at our Shorescripts litigation 
where an online digital platform with something like a 95% share and two two-sided markets engaged in a whole system of exclusionary conduct. So the consumer welfare standard is a lot more supple, a lot more flexible than it's sometimes given credit for. Um, and that's the, that's the heuristic that we use when we're uh, considering transactions and evaluating challenged conduct. Bill, as, as a practitioner, um, one of the first instructions that uh, a court gives a jury um, when it's presenting an antitrust case on unreasonable restraint of trade, um, it's, it refers to the Sherman Act as, as a charter of economic freedom. Yeah, is that, is and then you usually, you usually use that line in closing statement. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the world of practitioners, or this, someone who is occasionally on the pirate ship, as I think it was called, um, the, you think of this as you know, what's going to work in court, and the this Bork debate about what consumer welfare means I don't think has penetrated most judges because most judges you know, want to know more about antitrust and aren't that, aren't that versed in it. So I think of, they think of it as Daniel does. They want to hear about quality. They want to hear about price. They want to hear output. They're open-minded to all those things. On the... Within the pirate ship, there's a bias towards quantification of price because that's where the incentives are. Um, yes, you, you, uh, if you're doing a class action, you talk about reduced innovation, but you're not going to get 30% of, of reduced innovation. So, and you're not gonna get a class certified based on reduced <coughs> innovation. The requirement for certifying a class is that all or virtually all class members have to suffer antitrust injury, which means you have to show some sort of quantitative effect, which is inevitably uh, a, an overcharge effect or an undercharge effect, depending on whether it's a monopoly or monop monopsony effect. So there's this huge bias towards consumer welfare becoming um, the, the quantitative effects even if the other quality effects are sometimes addressed. In order to have a case based on the quality effects, you have to, in effect, be willing to suffer the consequences of only winning a major injunction that changes an industry or changes something significantly, because the economic incentives for that are, are much less. So, for example, you, know, uh, you have to be willing to push on in a case when that happens. Uh, Michael began the O'Bannon case uh, against the NCAA. At some point, the judge said this can't proceed as a damages class, and it can proceed only as an injunction class. At that point, all of the economics change as a practical matter in terms of the, the way things are structured. And, uh, and then it's up to the lawyers to march on, uh, which is what happened there. And the actual uh, incentives, the actual ability to even recoup money in an antitrust case for an injunction that changes an industry uh, are very problematic because um, obviously everybody knows there's a fee shifting provision of the antitrust laws. Uh, but it, unlike other areas under state laws, you're not going to get a multiplier and you're also not going to get your expert expenses back. And the way things are set up, that's many, many millions of dollars in the whole, so you're basically just saying, I'm going to take, I'm going to take this on as a as a loss leader because I want to do this as part of my career, um, and that's the way it's practically set up right now. And so, consumer welfare, when it comes to private enforcement, often so often emphasizes the quantitative factors. As the objective of antitrust policy or antitrust reach, um, Tad, would would you adjust? Um, the brand um, consumer welfare? No, not at all. Uh, I, I think that it's kind of assumed, uh, it's, it's become a term of art in antitrust law, and I think uh, as enforced, it's precisely what, uh, what uh, uh, Judge Bork uh, recommended, and I think that's, uh, that's where it ought to be left. As I say, the, the, the instrumental variable of antitrust, the thing that the statute forces the court to decide on, is effect on competition. And it's only at the stage where you have a difficult issue of whether the practice was, whether, uh, whether the, the practice was the kind of practice that would tend to hurt output and total welfare uh, or, or benefit it, that's when you have to make uh, the more uh, sophisticated analysis. But that's, 
That's primarily, I, I was interested in this remark because that's primarily a question of the appellate law. You do not ask a district court under any circumstances I can think of, except on the legal issue of how to categorize and set up the elements of proof for the trial. You do not ask a district court to measure the effects of a practice on consumer welfare. That is, that is the obligation of the Supreme Court in light of the statute. It's a big difference between what government and private, and private enforcers have to do. But just to pick up on that, so one peculiarity of the US enforcement system, or I say peculiarity, it's a point of difference with, for example, the European approach, is that like private plaintiffs, <coughs> We don't, you know, the, the exercise of antitrust enforcement, whether it's blocking a merger or blocking a challenge to practice, we don't do that in the building, right? We have to go to a neutral decision maker and prove our case. And the, you know, just, just like private plaintiffs do, um, we face judges who will often require very extensive, very detailed, sometimes heavily quantified, um, you know, evidence or proof in support of a theory of harm. So to the extent that, you know, there is some criticism about you know, certain forms of failure of enforcement, I think it's instructive to kind of look at cases where not just the FTC, but DOJ and the states have brought cases that are in some sense on or pushing the frontier of you know, antitrust or merger control law. Um, and the court has concluded that what, what's been presented as an evidentiary record isn't sufficient. Look at AT&T Time Warner, look at Steris on potential competition, look at T-Mobile Sprint, look at Ivonic on supply side substitution, Amex. These are all cases where the courts, a core of the court's decision was something about the adequacy of the evidence that was offered up by even a government plaintiff um, to support an inference of anti-competitive harm. So the standards are extremely high, even for the government when it's acting as a plaintiff. Steve? Yeah, I, I think this issue of adequacy of evidence is really what, what we should be talking about more, more than the standard. And I, I think what, what people like Tim are concerned with, I, I'm concerned with it as well, that the burden, the evidentiary burden on plaintiffs is too high, uh, particularly in Section 2 cases, which is, if we're talking about dominant platforms, that, 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 that's what we're talking about. So, I mean, Section 2 requires a showing monopoly power or dangerous probability, and it requires evidence of, of anti-competitive effect. And in that situation, you face a really fundamental bias in the process because the financial stakes in Section 2 cases are much higher for the defendant than they are for the plaintiff. And Bill really emphasized that. You know, if, he, if he's representing a plaintiff, uh, he's going to get one-third of the profits, of the lost profits of the plaintiff. Well, the monopolist is fighting not for a third of the profits for past conduct, for damages. The monopolist is trying to maintain that monopoly power over time. And the value of maintaining the monopoly power is much higher than the value of achieving a competitive market. That is, the, the monopolist will lose much more money if it loses than the plaintiff would gain if it wins at the level of the injunction. And of course, the, the damages are just a transfer. They don't, they don't affect the skew in the, uh, in the stakes at all. And since the Section 2 case is worth so much more to the defendant, they're going to work ever harder to win than the plaintiff is going to. They're going to spend much more money and effort on the litigation than, than the plaintiff will. And if the judge doesn't take that into account, then outcomes are going to be biased because the, the judge is going to see, well, the, the defendant has more evidence, ignoring the fact that the defendant spent more because it's trying to preserve its monopoly power. And so the system is inherently biased towards false positives, I'm sorry, towards false negatives, away from false positives. And that's, that's a fundamental in Section 2, reinforced from the, by the fact that the, burden of, that the burden of proof on the plaintiff is very high in Section 2. So that's what's got to be changed. And looking at the changing dynamic from um, an industrial economy to a technological economy, again, we're focusing on single firm offenses. And one of the um, aspects of single firm offenses deals with um, refusal to deals, where a single firm decides that it, it, it is going to suppress either by predatory conduct or, or otherwise um, an entrant uh, coming into the market. At one time, th there was reference um, in Supreme Court decisions and lower court decisions of what they call an essential, <coughs> essential facilities doctrine. 
where one entity controls a particular facility that others have to utilize in order to gain entrance to a market, yet the controller of that facility would deny that entrant the opportunity um, to enter the market. Susan, um, have you either written or have thoughts about whether or not uh, <laughs> an essential facilities doctrine should be considered in terms of economic you know, or commercial um, consumer welfare? Uh, so, yes, um, and I guess I would, so, so, the, so the short answer would be that, that I- That was a softball. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but so, you know, I think that the, the, the question, I think, Michael, as you were kind of posing it, is do we need um, to kind of revisit or go back to essential facilities law, is that a good idea sort of to, to apply to, to digital platforms? And is that, has is that has it come of age because of, of the change from industry to digital platform where there are more single firms, not necessarily in monopoly positions, um, those firms that have 70 or more percent you know, market share, but are clearly in a position of being dominant where they have um, passed a tipping point or have acquired the benefits of a tipping point so that they can, in essence, influence movements or direction to that market by reason of their presence, even if it's less than 70%. Yeah. So, so, you know, so I guess what I would do is I'd sort of go, to go back just a little bit, you know, sort of to uh, the heyday of essential facilities analysis in, in the 1970s. Um, came across an article that, that nicely sort of uh, uh, consolidated all the cases that were coming up uh, claiming uh, that a particular facility was essential. And, and here's, here's a, 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 an incomplete list of, of what was, was being litigated in the, case, in the cases. So potential essential facilities were stock exchanges, produce markets, real estate listing services, electricity and gas networks, airports, sports stadiums, phone systems, Contracting advantages, replacement parts, harbor, and facility, harbor facilities, uh, power generation networks, and I could go on. Um, so, so I think that the first lesson is that uh, it's it's easy to claim and and maybe to believe um, that a f particular facility really is essential to compete. Um, so, but, but we've, we've moved away since the 70s from claiming essential, sort of thinking essential facilities generally is a good thing, or at least it's lost the debate so far in, in the courts. I think really for two principal reasons. The first is, I think there's been, there's been a lot of concern articulated about whether essential facilities doctrine um, inadvertently, but, but uh, importantly, creates perverse incentives uh, both for the dominant firm and for its competitors um, not to compete as hard, uh, which is not exactly the purpose of antitrust law. Um, a little bit also that it puts uh, regulators potentially in the, in the role of, of being central planners. And then I think second is, is the um, kind of on reflection that the problem of central facilities doctrine was trying to get at is really just a subspecies of refusal to deal law. So I think the question would be is there um, sort, of, sort of taking each of those in turn, <clears throat> sort of on the first question, is there some reason to think we should be less concerned uh, about that effect on uh, innovation incentives for digital platforms um, than we were with respect to all the other types of uh, facilities that I mentioned a minute ago. And then the second question would be, apart from that, is there some reason to think either that the market structure or other characteristics of digital platforms uh, causes, causes di refusal to deal law to be adequate to deal with all these other types of, of uh, markets, but not digital platforms? So um, addressing the first one, and I, I, may, I may end up um, only sort of uh, uh, touching briefly on the second. Um, I actually, so I, I would submit that, that far from there being less reason to be concerned about the adverse effects um, on innovation incentives and digital platforms, there's actually powerful reasons to think, uh, that, to have more concern. So let me just take the uh, Google Shopping case, which we heard about this morning as an example. So, um, so that was a case where, um, you know, so the allegation is, is or I'm just going to stylize it, that Google is, is effectively an essential facility that people have to go through in order to engage in online shopping. 
that for some reason they can't go directly to Amazon or something. Um, and so uh, the, the FTC actually looked at that hard too. Um, and, um, and I was representing Google at the time. Um, and I think uh, Bill Kovacic asked why did the FTC not bring the case. I think the simple answer might be that the law is pretty different in the US versus the EC. Um, in the US, um, Michael Salinger was the economic expert for Google. He looked at all of the launch reports for, for uh, certain <coughs> modifications that Google made and concluded that they were all undertaken for pro-competitive reasons, not to harm competitors. In the United States, under product uh, innovation law, that, that put the FTC in a tough spot. That's not the, that, you know, I'm not a Euro European lawyer, but that was not the end of the story, as, as, as we can see in Europe. What was really central, and I think this goes to kind of what, what, how essential facilities law can play out, the algorithm that was really central in the, the European shopping case, it was also being investigated in, in the US, was a general purpose uh, quality algorithm that had been developed. Um, people forget that about 10 years ago, there was kind of a widespread perception that Google was losing the battle to, to keep spammers kind of out, of out of its organic rankings, that the quality of, of search results was going down. And in combating that, a Google engineer had come up with a really interesting and I thought clever um, way of, of trying to, to uh, rectify that. So, so that algorithm was a general purpose algorithm. It wasn't targeted at anybody. Um, and it was, it was actually based on consumer behavior. Um, at, at the time, this was highly view, viewed as highly trade secret information. And, um, I'll fudge the, the details just a teeny bit, but it was basically <coughs> if users uh, did a search uh, or entered a query, clicked on a result, went back to Google, entered the same query, and then went someplace else, if they didn't go back to that first site, that was sort of a, a mark against you from a quality perspective. It turned out that kind of simple idea, sort of letting people vote with their clicks, had really dramatic effects in improving the quality of Google search results all across the board. Affected really hundreds, thousands of different types of sites. Um, it did also affect, one of, the, one of the types of sites it affected was consumer um, comparison shopping sites. So I don't believe that the EC ever found, and I don't think the evidence showed that uh, Google was even really aware of comparison shopping sites. But there's no doubt that the algorithm had powerful uh, impact on, as I said, thousands of different types of sites, um, and that included comparison shopping sites. So um, when you think about essential facilities law, so the, what the EC ended up finding was that Google didn't apply that general purpose algorithm to a type of ads unit that the EC says competes with comparison shopping sites. As somebody who's counseled Google, I didn't counsel them on this, but I guess if I had been asked, before you implement this general quality improvement, would you have have, have to apply the, this algorithm that applies to organic results to ads? I think I would have told them no. Um, the ads unit didn't affect where organic uh, results ranked. It actually displaced ads. Um, if it if it displaced anything, and where I add, you know, ads pay for pay for the service. So if you'd ask me to, you know, sort of, would, would generally I expect that you have to have quality for ads that are showing against content on your TV? Do they have to meet the same standard? I would have said no to. In any event, um, so the what the EC concluded was that uh, Google should have figured out either presumably. Um, a way to apply that standard to its ad service or possibly had to reconfigure um, its results probably to, to take functionality away from its ad unit um, or otherwise have had to slow down the introduction of this innovation. And I think this really gets at the heart of kind of the problem with the central facilities analysis, which is, um, you know, sort of the if you would now, we're looking forward and you're counseling Google, um, 
is it better off not to introduce really powerful innovation changes? Because you don't really know who all might complain. Lots of people claim to compete with Google. Um, would you need to think about um, crippling functionality? Would you need to, as a lawyer, tell them to slow down the introduction of the innovation, do more testing? When exactly is it, is it okay to, to introduce that innovation? So, you know, I think that the, the concern about um, slowing down innovation, about getting uh, regulators putting them in a tough spot in terms of saying, well, you know, here's how you need to change your product uh, to, to apply uh, an equal access standard. And then finally, you know, interestingly, um, you know, the, the comparison shopping sites to this day are complaining to the EC that its remedy isn't sufficient, that they haven't sent enough traffic to those, to those sites. Um, you know, the, but you know, what, what that original quality signal said was that whatever we might objectively think, consumers didn't like those sites. But rather than innovate and, and improve, um, instead, they're petitioning the EC for basically what you could think of as sort of a competition umbrella, that they should get some kind of uh, quota of, of traffic. And, and what ultimately is the impact on the user of, of Google having to force people to go to sites that they otherwise would have voted not to go to. So you would at least be cautious about reviving um, a uh, essential facilities doctrine. Well, if, if we yes, yeah, so, so I mean the second part of the of the test, and, and I'll and I'll stop and, and let other people speak to it. I, I you know obviously you could say okay we're gonna we're willing to take some huge innovation hit here um, because there's something unique about digital platforms, either in terms of how entrenched they are, the structure of the market, or something that that's gonna overcome these problems. But I think it certainly would be the case that the problems that have caused us in all those other markets to say uh, refusal to deal law is good enough, um, that, that all those reasons apply in spades here. So Steve, with regard to digital platforms, um, would you revive the essential facilities doctrine? Um, well, I don't, I don't like calling it the essential facilities doctrine, but uh, yeah, I think I would. I mean, look, I, th I think if you go back to basics, uh, you can see why, why it should live. Uh, what the Essential Facilities Doctrine really is all about is under what conditions is a refusal to deal by a vertically integrated monopolist, under what conditions does that violate Section 2? And the Supreme Court, uh, you know, as Susan pointed out, ra raised some cautions about that. Uh, one caution was, well, if you force these people that don't like each other to cooperate with one another, they're going to collude. And that, that's pretty silly because, you know, if you think if people cooperate, they're going to collude, then, there's also, then you should be banning voluntary agreements, not involuntary ones. The second concern they had was about a loss of innovation incentives. And that one was also pretty weak because if you have a vertically integrated monopolist, you can't, they're only a monopolist if there's <coughs> durable barriers to entry. And so the idea that it's going to reduce innovation by the entrant, well, no. The idea is if the entrant can't get access to the facility, they're not, they're not going to do anything. So they're going to have less innovation if they don't have access. If they have access, they can use the foothold from getting the access and then integrating upstream. Just like middleware in the Microsoft case, if you let middleware live, that would ultimately lead to operating system competition. So they're, they're, the innovation caution that the Supreme Court had also was pretty weak in the context of digital markets. So the one, the, the, the one thing that carried the weight is the central planning concern. Gee, we, you know, red baiting. Uh, we don't want to, courts aren't very good at deciding whether prices are too <coughs> high or too low. And you know, we know that carries a lot of weight in Brook Group. Now, I, th I think it shouldn't carry weight here for two reasons. One, in Brook Group we were worried about deterring low prices. But here, with a refusal to deal, the way the monopolist refuses to deal, it makes an offer that the, that the plaintiff will refuse. That's what Aspen was all about. So if, if the monopolist is saying, I will give you access to the network if you pay a really high price, well, that's a high price. We're less concerned about deterring high prices. We, we don't like high prices. So that, as a general matter, 
Brook Group doesn't answer, doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. Secondly, a district court can often come up with a price. You can use the price from the previous voluntary course of dealing. That, that's a starting point for what, for what the price would be. Second, in all of these situations, very much unlike Trinco, the monopolist is dealing with non-competitors, giving them access to the network, but they're just denying access to the network or giving inferior access to the network to competitors. And so you have a benchmark. The, what the monopolist ought to be doing is giving the same access at the same price to the competitors as they give to the non-competitors. And if those two fail, if you have to actually come up with a price, there are, there's methodologies coming out of regulation, something called the Efficient Components Pricing, uh, pricing Relationship, ECPR, that you can use in order to construct a price. So I think the doctrine should live thinking about it in terms of refusal to deal rather than a such facility slogan. So I think the doctrine should live, and it appears, at least for the moment, it does live. I mean, if you haven't read this Via Media case against Con Via Media v. Comcast, it's really uh, an opinion worth, uh, worth reading. As the court said, the only way to distinguish this case from Aspen is, as a matter of law, is to say that, that Aspen only <coughs> concerns ski resorts. Yeah, but, but Steve, I guess I would turn that back around on you because I, I mean I, I I think refusal to deal law lives, um, and so and and if anything, the Comcast case shows we don't need essential facilities doctrine, and and well, I, I'd be hard pressed to say there was anything about Comcast. You know, I don't mean to pick on Comcast, but but in, entrenched cable uh, monopolists that you would say that somehow uh, they should get the benefit of a, of an easier rule than digital platforms. I mean, the sort of, w w what is it about sort of switching costs, um, you know, sort of the, the monopolist being entrenched, which um, is a bad pun, but, you know, literally entrenched. Um, but, you know, sort of the, the uh, presumably you're not arguing that Comcast's smart position is, is there any, that the court was expressed about saying it was a two-sided platform, the case involved advertising, how would you distinguish that from sort of, because I, I agree with you that I think refusal to deal law works. It's perfectly applicable to, to meet to the, to the case at hand, but I think that proves why we don't need essential facilities doctrine. I think that's why it's gone away. But, but Susan, I, I think since the beginning, since St. Louis Terminal Railroads, the, the essential facilities doctrine has been about refusals to deal. Terminal Railroad was about a concerted refusal to deal. Associated Press was about a concerted refusal to deal. So what we're talking about on digital platforms is not concerted refusals to deal, it's about single firm refusals to deal. And the cases that, that show up are all about vertically integrated monopolists. That's what Verizon was. Uh, they were a monopolist in DSL and they were a monopolist in the network. You know, the, the big single firm essential facility slash Refusal to deal case is the AT&T case, MCI versus AT&T. And in that case, AT&T was a long distance monopolist and they were a local loop monopolist. And while they hooked up many private long distance firms to their local network in private networks, when you had these two nascent competitors, MCI and, and, and Southern Pacific, when they wanted to hook up to the local loop network in order to sell long distance, AT&T didn't let them hook up. It, it, or, you know, it let them hook up and then it, it broke the system. So, and in that case, the Seventh Circuit actually said the essential facilities doctrine was fine. And Arita said, gee, the essential facilities doctrine was fine there. Well, it was all about refusals to deal. Now, no, I, don't, I would not treat an entrenched cable monopolist any differently than I would treat an entrenched search monopolist. I'd just chime in to agree, right? I think the refusal to deal frame is always the one that has done work. So if you think of the classical formulations of essential facilities, that line of attack goes away as soon as there is an offer to deal on the table, right, regardless of its terms. So the essential facilities doctrine as such was always very thin, and what was really sitting behind it, and what's going to do the work in the kind of difficult cases that we're talking about is what we think about the law of refusal to deal under Section 2. And in that regard, I just wanted to underscore something that Steve said, 
which is that there is a difference to me, you know, separate and apart from any individual case, there is a difference in kind, I think, between, you know, engaging more favorably with your own upstream division than you do with all third parties on the one hand, which is ubiquitous, and then on the other hand, engaging with all third parties on certain terms, with the exception of actual or potential competitors who you target for various forms of degradation or termination, which is much more suspicious, which can be handled under refusal to deal framework without anything like the kind of scale of the chilling concerns that we would have in the first case. And to the extent that what we're talking about is the second, where really it seems to be sort of nakedly exclusionary as a scheme, and you've got an honest to God monopolist, which is a demanding standard under section two, then I think these refusal to deal claims start to seem much more appealing. Yeah, I can, I can chip in about how this via media case does make refusal to deal cases much much more workable, and it's sort of an it's if you have a refusal to deal situation, um, it's it's worth looking at this case because it illustrates how you can make it how you can make it work. And refusal to deal cases oftentimes come up in business to business situations where the one party it's it can be existential for them. So you are actually seeing more despite Trinco you are seeing more refusal to deal cases being brought uh, with it by non-governmental entities and litigated su uh, such as this via media case. And some of the things that are favorable in this case is it, going through all the duty to deal cases, one of the things it emphasizes is that even the, uh, the cases that are extremely tight on duty to deal, such as Judge Gorsuch's opinion in the Tenth Circuit uh, in Novell, they're all after a trial. There's like, it's, it's saying it's pretty simple. If you plead something close to Aspen's scheme, the motion to dismiss, move forward. And even after that, it, it talks about uh, pushing together the analysis of, of uh, anti-competitive restrictions and then pro-business justifications. Because uh, Trinko talks about, um, you know, does it make economic sense? Is it irrational? Uh, is it... Uh, is there a justification other than the anti-competitive restraints? And Via Media makes the point, well, uh, and even looks at the jury instructions in Aspen's scheme, makes the point that now you're into the area of pro-business justifications, and that's a jury issue, it says, um, and which is really quite important. And it also emphasizes the point that Daniel and, and Steve both made, uh, called the non-discrimination point. Um, is this uh, way you're treating this competitor the way you are treating others in a competitive, in a competitive framework? And if you're not, uh, it ties it to both Aspen's scheme, it also ties it to the, 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 um, the part about an Aspen scheme about whether it has to be uh, profitable in the short term. Because if you've got two different lines of businesses and you're choosing one for the competitor and not and one for the uh, in a competitive environment that's different with the other, that reflects on a business decision about what would be profitable in a competitive environment. And so it, it links those things together. Uh, it's got a number of uh, different points, and going back to when we've been judge counting who appointed who on the bench, uh, there's a Nix Nixon appointee, an Obama appointee, <laughs> and a Trump appointee, and uh, uh, Judge Brennan, the Trump appointee, has a dissent, but not from the duty to deal aspect. He's not entirely happy with the way it's phrased, but he agrees it's been pled, it should move forward, which indicates to me that there's, whether you call it essential facilities or duty to deal, that for businesses that <coughs> are in this sort of trouble, there is some room to bring these claims. So in, yeah, this, in this field of, of duty to deal and, and or essential facilities with regard to digital platforms, um, that's not the only way in, in which a digital platform can make it more difficult, if not foreclose, a potential market competitive entry. Um, the FTC recently undertook the challenge Qualcomm um, under a novel theory of raising rival costs. Daniel, um, does, does that um, achieve the ob objective uh, that, we, that you identified before of uh, antitrust policy? Gosh, uh, so let me, let me say just a couple things. And I won't say too much about Qualcomm. Obviously, it's a matter that's in sort of litigation right now. We just had the oral argument on appeal. Uh, and we're waiting to see uh, what the, the Ninth Circuit will say. 
Um, but let me say a couple things. Thing number one is there is nothing novel, I think, about a raising rivals' costs or a competitive foreclosure paradigm as a means of identifying troubling conduct under Section 2 or Section 1. So we've had a substantial foreclosure test since, you know, Tampa Electric in 1963 for exclusive dealing. We use that same foreclosure paradigm for, you know, everything for a tying to, you know, market share commitments or, you know, purchasing share commitments and agreements. So um, the conduct that's challenged in Qualcomm, there's a variety of different patterns of conduct that are identified in the complaint and that were proved at trial. But the core one, uh, the no license, no chips policy, really has effects that are virtually identical to traditional exclusivity um, in that they involve essentially levying a, an economic tax on um, purchases from rivals of the monopolist. So to the extent that we're talking about, let's say, the Qualcomm case, what I think it shows us is the following. We have, within the consumer welfare standard, um, and within the pretty broad ground rules that antitrust has established, concerns about predation on the one hand, foreclosure on the other, um, anti-competitive acquisitions as a third, uh, we have very broad conceptual tools and a conceptual vocabulary that lets us confront even novel practices, novel technologies, novel markets. But to the extent that what's going on, as for example in the Qualcomm case, is a company that acquires or maintains monopoly power and is doing so through means that are unrelated to efficiency and that as a result competition and consumers are harmed, the antitrust laws that we've got and the consumer welfare standard that we've got let us do an awful lot that is creative or in some sense responding to novel problems. And let me just say one more thing about Section 2 to pick up on, on something that either Steve or Tad mentioned earlier about Section 2. So uh, what I understood them to suggest was that the, the Section 2 establishes a demanding or a troublingly demanding causal test. My intuition is that it's actually the other way around. And that one of the areas where we could have a good deal of promising development in antitrust doctrine in a way that will really make a difference in dynamic markets is in the causal test for Section 2, our prohibition on monopolization. So it's pretty clearly established that the test for causation under Section 7 of the Clayton Act when we're reviewing mergers with actual potential competitors is a pretty demanding but-for standard of causation. And it seems that the same applies under Section 1. But under Section 2, there is some intriguing language in the Microsoft opinion that isn't original with that, but it became famous in the Microsoft opinion, suggesting that when we're dealing with the monopolization offense, the causal test is really much more flexible, particularly when we're dealing with dynamic markets and theories about lost future competition. And the language is, the challenged conduct has to be, quote, reasonably capable of making a significant contribution to monopoly maintenance or acquisition. And I think one area, so one thing that you'll have seen recently from the FTC, is the use of Section 2, in addition to Section 7, to challenge acquisitions where an incumbent monopolist has used mergers or acquisitions to target in, uh, incoming rivals, whether they're nascent or potential competitors. That causal flexibility <coughs> under Section 2 is going to be a crucial frontier for the development of antitrust law in some of these digital cases. So as we're thinking about what the FTC is doing, what others are doing, in a way that will demonstrate or at least test the adequacy of existing law to respond to some of the complexities of dynamic markets, I think a real place for optimism is in the causal threshold under Section 2 and the possibility that courts will recognize that there can be real threats to competition and real damage to competition that arises from acquisitions of incoming competitors or exclusionary conduct that's directed towards them. Ted? Um with regard to raising rival costs, um, do you feel that that, that is um, uh, an element that uh, fits into your concept of uh, either consumer welfare or what I would call antitrust welfare? Uh, let, let me answer it this way, uh, Michael. First of all, uh, I, Daniel, I would feel terrible if you didn't realize that that was Steve's remark <laughs> about, about excessive burdens that, that, uh, and, and not mine. Uh, I, um, I think that was obvious to everyone. Good. Well, <laughs> well since, since Daniel is working in that, uh, you know, trying to stay out of the dungeon, I wanted to give him some help in that regard. You know, Maybe I'm... George Mason would not be happy if it got attributed to you. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But uh, uh, Steve will no, no doubt be, uh, uh, be not shocked to hear that I don't think that raising rivals' costs 
uh, constitutes an, an independently significant category of antitrust offenses, and I believe I'm still correct in saying that no court has ever endorsed that as a theory as such. However, Michael, uh, raising Ravel's cost is definitely uh, is, is an aspect to be considered in assessing the exclusionary impact of a practice otherwise challenged under, uh, under Section 2. If you, uh, if you uh, uh, tack on a new component, if you start, if you start offering uh, sophisticated navigation systems as part of your farm tractor, you may raise rivals' costs in the sense that you have now required your main competitors to also offer a, a similar component. But to me, that sounds like, I mean, unless there's some very strange and nefarious unique fact, that sounds like competition on the merits to me. But nevertheless, in, in a more ambiguous case, where the, uh, where, where the competitive motivation, there may be a lack of a business justification, uh, it, uh, the, the degree to which conduct raises rivals' costs can be considered in assessing whether, uh, whether a practice is illegally exclusionary. Steve, you had something to add? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> it makes me feel so good to think that 35 years later, I can put on my Wikipedia page, raising rivals' costs, still novel after all these years. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, Todd, you should read the title of Crap Maker and Salop. It's Raising Rivals' Costs to Gain Power Over Price. So unless market power results from it, if all you're doing is raising rivals' costs because you made a better product and they have to match it, that would not be liable under, un, under the standard. Spoken like a gentleman. Okay. Now, you know, in, ter in terms of the standard, I, look, what I think is most significant about Microsoft is not the, uh, is, is not what Dan alluded to, but the fact that they did not adopt this no economic sense test, which both parties thought they were litigating under, and instead it adopted a section two rule of reason balancing standard. And that's really gonna push us forward because that lowers the, the evidentiary burden on, on plaintiffs to show harm exceeding benefits, not that you also need to show any competitive intent in the sense of uh, no economic sense. You know, the example I use in class to say what's wrong with this no economic sense standard, and, and it, it goes to what Susan, Susan's defense of Google, is suppose you have a platform monopolist and they come up with an innovation that has a value of $5. And suppose the cost per unit, $5 per unit, and suppose the cost is only $3. Okay, so the value that consumers place on, on the innovation exceeds the cost of the innovation. That conduct would not violate the no economic sense. No economic sense uh, would only go after it if the cost of the innovation was $7. It was more than the value. But if you drill down a little deeper on that, suppose that as a result of the innovation, they also eliminated interoperability, and as a result, it raised barriers to entry and the dominant firm was able to raise price by $50. Well, here you have this conduct that gives consumers extra value of $5 but raises price by $50. I follow Paul Romer on this one. I don't think that's a very good deal for consumers. Yet that conduct would be immunized under the no economic sense test. It would not be immunized under the Section 2 rule of reason balancing standard. So if what Google did was gee, their fancy new algorithm improved the value of the search by 50 cents value, but it led to higher advertising prices of $5, well, then not such a good deal for competition. I'm going to throw out a softball, but put a limit, you know, on, on, times of, <clears throat> on the time of response. So one of the more potentially controversial digital platform uh, decisions of the Supreme Court recently is, is an Amex, dealing with two-sided platforms. And we're seeing more and more in district court cases, literally every defendant arguing that every market is two-sided. Um, Ted, what is, what is your judgment with regard to the application of two-sided markets to a single platform, or whether really are, they are two different markets that just happen to utilize a platform um, 
that uh, reaches a particular end user? Well, uh, I, I recall one of the earlier panels, the, the statement was made that uh, Google and Facebook are sometimes looked at as digital platforms and two-sided platforms when in fact they're not. Uh, I think it has to be a, a, uh, a coherent and specific analysis in each specific case because there are examples like the old Varane Journal case was mentioned uh, back in the, you know, when it, everything was steam fired and coal, you know, coal fired and steam powered and you had uh, news, printed newspapers that were distributed throughout the village uh, every morning. Uh, you, you had the newspaper providing content uh, to try to get eyeballs so that would be sold to advertisers and query whether that really would be uh, analyzed as a, as a two-sided market. However, uh, I think Ohio versus American Express uh, was uh, really a quintessential uh, two-sided market case. In other words, it's, it's, there, there is no basis to deny that you had to analyze the entire uh, four-party operation uh, and the relationships among all the parties in order to see that analysis of a single market uh, in any part of that system was just giving you misleading results. Now, we know that because fortunately, one of our greatest antitrust analysts, uh, somebody, somebody that Mike Spence called the greatest economist of his generation who was a lawyer, and that means Bill Baxter, uh, he, he had the following wonderful uh, uh, thing happen. He was hired to do a very lengthy study of electronic funds transfer when it was introduced to the banking system at a time when almost all financial transactions that were not in cash were settled by hard copy checks. And an enormous system arose in which these checks were physically moved around from the, uh, the you know, the customer would give them to the merchant, the merchant would give them to his bank, the, uh, the merchant's bank would send them to the, uh, to the customer's bank for clearance and, and, uh, and around it went. And he recognized that, the, that there is a possibility for exploitation at the point where the check is presented to the customer's bank. How do you protect against uh, uh, excessive and totally unreasonable surcharges for clearing that check at the customer's bank? You, you set a maximum as for the clearance price. You set the price of that service and you, and you limit it. And so that when the credit card systems emerged, he instantly recognized that it's a, it's a formally identical problem. That the, uh, when, when, the, uh, uh, when the merchant's bank presents the credit card transaction to the cardholder's bank, there's the same opportunity for holdup. And he wrote this fabulous analysis showing uh, very persuasively uh, that, this, uh, that the setting of the interchange fee was essentially a way of handling an unavoidable externality that arose by virtue of the structure of this system. So it was this insight that was adopted and expanded and, and, and very well explained by Evans and Schmalensee, who did, who did the analysis cited by the Supreme Court in Ohio versus American Express. It's, it's as right a decision, you know, it's as right as you can get as a matter of antitrust law. It's as right as saying, that, that Einstein adopted a better theory of gravitation than Newton. That's how right it is. <laughs> so, Steve, would you be Newton or Einstein with regard to what you would like to respond? Oh, my God. Ted, that was really a softball, but... Uh, <laughs> I do I, my best. I, let's start with Baxter. Uh, yeah, Baxter, Baxter's insight about opportunism by the acquired by the issuing banks was, was really very good. But Tad, you meant, but American Express was not about that. American Express was about a no steering rule. And you may be unaware of the fact that I got Bill Baxter to testify for the plaintiff in a no steering case, the Pulse ATM arbitration, in which he said the no steering rules, which were that case were ATM surcharges, were a violation of the antitrust laws. Uh, secondly, you. Bill Baxter's insight did not apply to, not only did it not apply to American Express, it didn't apply to the cases that are being brought against the card networks now. Because those cases are attacking not the interchange fee setting particularly, but rather the honor all cards rule that prevents the merchant from going to Chase and saying, 
Chase, I'm not going to accept your Visa cards unless you give me a lower price. The honor roll cards rules for, the, for, the, for Visa and MasterCard say you have to, if you take one Visa card, you have to take every Visa card. And if you take MasterCard, you have to take Visa cards. So there's no, no ability for the merchant to negotiate. So it's not so much the collective setting of a maximum interchange fee, it's the fact that the honor roll cards rule, the fact that a merchant can't negotiate with an individual card issuer means that the maximum fee turns into the minimum fee as well. And that's what violates the antitrust laws. Recently, the NCAA argued um, that college <coughs> sports involves a two-sided market. Bill, um, do you believe that the decision in Amex should go beyond you know, digital platforms? Uh, it, the Supreme Court sometimes talks about the price of, of uh, not having these doctrines, there's a price to having these doctrines. So uh, the two-sided market is announced, and in the, our case against Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, they decide that health insurers are a two-sided market between hospitals and uh, insurers. It, it particularly plays havoc uh, in the area of private enforcement, because private enforcement also uh, usually involves, or often involves, multiple plaintiff groups. And if there's one price for a transaction uh, that involves four parties or more, uh, then all of a sudden you get multiple groups claiming their share of that price. Uh, they will add up to more than the total amount, than the total price. And uh, the defendants uh, will enjoy the benefits of that, particularly if there's a single trial uh, or a single hearing where everybody is claiming too much. Uh, and so you find that after the, uh, after the uh, American Express decision uh, that everything is a two-sided market as it's litigated. And of course, most or all of these will lose, but there is a transaction cost to all of these in terms of antitrust enforcement. In, in, close, in the last question before we open uh, um, the forum to questions, we started the morning with Paul Romer's comments about legislation uh, as opposed to um, judicial decisions or, or jury judgments or jury verdicts, you know, making um, the decisions with regard to what is or is not, you know, an unreasonable restraint of trade. But even legislative solutions in today's digital markets, you know, truly transcend national approaches and encompass business practices you know, that um, uh, in, are virtually you know, u in universal in, in their implications and applications. What approach can US courts have with regard to influencing digital platforms which don't have hundreds or thousands or even millions of customers, but literally billions of customers that, that are, are not bound by traditional, you know, national geographies. Steve? I think I want to think about this. I'll, let's, <laughs> you should, I'll pass on this one. All right. How about from an enforcer? Daniel? Sure. Uh, so I take the, the thrust of the question to be... And this what, is personal, not for the... Uh, everything I say is personal. Right. <laughs> i got to stay out of jail, guys. Okay. So... Here is what I would say. I think sometimes, and I take your question to be, courts have to craft remedies, these problems to the extent that we might be talking about some large category of challenged or challengeable practices in certain sectors of the economy. They you know, have a certain scale. What can or should courts do? I think in that form, the question is almost unanswerable, right? So there is sometimes a tendency to go straight to the remedy discussion and skip over what, in some sense, is the most important step which is that antitrust enforcement, as distinct from all the other tools of legislative and executive and administrative and regulatory action, is a really good tool for responding to antitrust problems and antitrust violations. So question number one is, what is the specific conduct by a specific defendant that constitutes an antitrust violation and why? How and in what way is that practice, or does that transaction harm consumers? How does it harm competition? Only once you have an answer to that question in hand, once you've pled and proved your case, or once you're crafting a settlement based on a clear theory of harm, 
Is it meaningful or useful or appropriate for us as antitrust enforcers or for courts applying and interpreting the antitrust laws to start in that second phase of crafting a remedy? So the Supreme Court has told us at the FTC that we have pretty wide latitude to design a remedy, right? Um, it has to have a reasonable relation to the violation charged, can't be unreasonably overbroad, can't be unreasonably vague, but in general, we have a lot of flexibility. The place that we start from is understanding what is necessary and optimal to solve the specific problem that we're challenging in light of the specific business model and the specific market that we confront. And sometimes, I think when we talk about tech platforms or digital antitrust, we lose sight of the fact that even the familiar very large platforms have in some ways not that much to do with one another, right? A large search engine platform and a large social networking <coughs> platform and a large ride-sharing platform or a large e-retailing platform or anything else have radical differences in their business model, in their competitive environment, in what really matters to competition on the ground. So recognizing that we have a very broad toolkit, including structural remedies and behavioral remedies as well, I don't know that I have a good answer in the abstract because we don't start framing the question that way. We start by identifying specific conduct that violates the antitrust laws and we ask ourselves, in that market, given that practice by that company, what is necessary and optimal to solve that problem? So I recognize that's a very sort of inadequate and disappointing answer, but I think it's the best that I have. It, it's neither inadequate or disappointing, but um, it begs the question of what do you do with, as you say, a business model that's more universal than just, for example, any one country or any one continent? Um, if you decide in the United States to break up you know, a, a digital platform, how does that affect antitrust policy outside the United States where the same business model you know, is implemented? Um, there clearly is difference of, of thought with regard to antitrust policy objectives between the United States and Europe. So how, how can we, within the United States, um, really respond to antitrust objectives or policy by looking just at what we do in any one country? Yeah, I think that's a, a very fair question and one that I know a lot of folks inside academia and in the enforcement community spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, but I think the truth is that is not unique even to you know big tech or digital platform antitrust. So for a long, long time now, it has been true that competitively salient um, companies, that competitively salient practices, transactions, vastly exceed the national bounds of any one country. So we have for a long time been in the era of global mergers and practices that have significant cross-border effects. And sometimes different jurisdictions go their own way. So we've talked earlier about some of the ways in which European Union constitutional law, uh, sorry, not constitution, competition law differs from US antitrust law. You know, most obviously under Article 102, they have an exploitative abuse of dominance standard that we don't have here in the United States. So we recognize that sometimes the problems are common, but the approaches to the solution might be different. And we, like the European Union, have an effects-based test that says even if the conduct is partly located overseas, even if the defendant or the respondent is partly located overseas, if it matters to US competition, then it is fairly within the reach of our jurisdiction and our antitrust enforcement practice. Um, and to the extent that sometimes there might be some conflicts with what other regulators try to do, uh, we try to avoid that. We work very closely with not just partners in Europe, but in Japan and Korea and Brazil and all the way around the world. Um, and so to the extent that we can, we try to have a common conversation. A lot of cooperation goes on during merger review and during large conduct investigations. But ultimately, we're in the business of applying US antitrust rules to conduct that matters to US competition and US consumers. And that isn't distinctive or even unique to the tech platforms. Ted? Uh, Michael, I just wanted to say very briefly that we're about to get a very vivid illustration of, of what happens when a single jurisdiction tries to have profound and unique uh, effects via its antitrust enforcement on a platform or on a company that has a global, uh, a global business model. Uh, there is now pending, and uh, I would say, or I am advised that it's likely to be adopted, uh, a so-called Digitization Act, which is an amendment to the German competition law, which uh, could have been written 
by a committee consisting of Paul Romer and Eleanor Fox, because all of the, the <laughs> leveraging concerns and so on and the, the access to data concerns are embodied in that law, and it is simply going to be engrafted, you know, consumer welfare be damned, it's going to be engrafted on the German competition law if this amendment is adopted. And what's amazing to me is with the uh, European Commission being so hyperactive on this and having uh, made the competition commissioner, uh, 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 Commissioner Vestager, uh, granted her all these additional powers uh, within the commission so that competition can relate more intimately to the uh, other aspects of the European digital economy. Even so, it's interesting that a single EU member state, you know, albeit the largest and a very important one, is, is never, nevertheless getting way out front in terms of uh, legislation that would basically adopt this uh, progressive vision of platform regulation through the antitrust laws. So, so, uh, so assuming we're not all worried about viruses uh, this summer, uh, that's, uh, that's something to watch. Steve, anything that you wanted to add? All right, can we open, do we have time to open for questions? I heard one minute, so we're down to 59 <laughs> seconds. Well then, I, I will say that um, before we started the panel, so that we end on time, I was asked by, by Harry, you know, if I would say anything brilliant. And I told him I hope not, because I tried to avoid that as much as possible in my role as a moderator. And that function is to bring out the brilliance of those of the panelists you know, um, who are speaking to you. And I think they have shared their brilliance with you. And so I, I find that um, my, my role as the moderator has been satisfactorily served. So thank you all.